I'm going to give you a little bit of science tonight, but I'm hoping that you get a better feel for soil. This is a good topic. It's near and dear to me, and I hope by the end of this talk, it'll be near and dear to you or nearer and dearer to you. Master Gardeners in our webinars often start with uh, either this slide or a similar slide talking about the four important elements for success in the garden. It doesn't matter what kind of garden you have, and that's soil, water, sun, and air. Now, I'm talking about the soil tonight, but I'm going to integrate how aeration and sun and water all work together uh, for the integrity of soil and for the vitality of the soil. Now, I entitled my talk, The Universe Beneath Your Feet. And I did that because I think many of us don't really appreciate what's going on down under the ground. And I am not, my goal today is not to solve all the, all the soil problems in the county, but rather to give you a different perspective about soil. I want at the end of this that you think about soil differently because it is a resource we need to cherish and, and work with uh, carefully in order to maintain it. So first of all, before I get into the nuts and bolts, I want you to look at this picture. I took this last uh, October in Colorado. This is near Aspen, Colorado. And these mountains are called the Maroon Bells right here. This is surprising enough, Maroon Lake. Very beautiful valley. So what I want you to see is in the foreground, you have some grasses and some shrubs and so forth going up to the trees. But the stars of the show are the aspen trees that are in their full autumn glory right now. Interspersed with the aspen trees are the, the conifers that are indigenous to the Rocky Mountains. So why exactly am I showing you this picture? Because there's something here that's so fundamental we should think about. Nobody has ever drawn a plow up through this valley. Nobody's ever use a rototiller there or use a shovel to open wide areas. Nobody's ever walked through those trees with a bag of balanced fertilizer, synthetic fertilizer and thrown it out there to feed the trees and the shrubs. Nobody has walked in this valley with a backpack sprayer full of biocides. That would be uh, um, herbicide or insecticide or fungicide or miticide or any other kind of side. And with the exception of wildlife, which is pretty interesting up here, and some intrepid hikers, this valley has not really been walked upon. Nobody's tilled it, nobody's walked upon it, nobody's done any kind of augmentation of it, and look at how well it's doing. That's telling us that nature has devised mechanism or ways to provide everything that these plants need to thrive. And I want you to think about that. Yes, there's no tomatoes up there or strawberries or peach trees. But the the biological uh, <laughs> can't think of the word the biological processes that are going on in this valley are going on in your backyard as well, and we need to understand them and try to augment them and help them along the way. A lot of people, including me, like to use quotations sometimes. Generally, a quotation from somebody far wiser or, or smarter or insightful than me. And this is a Greek philosopher and historian from a long time ago, 400 BC, who said, to be a successful farmer, or you could say gardener, one must first know the nature of the soil. And that's what I'm gonna talk to you tonight about, the nature of the soil, but maybe from a perspective you've never thought about. So what is soil? Master gardeners always like to answer any science or any uh, gardening question with this. Well, it depends. It depends upon your perspective about what soil is. If you were a soil engineer or a mining engineer, you see soil as something to build upon or to dig through. If you are a geologist, you might look at soil simply from the mineral component of the rocks that that soil came from. Or if you're a gardener like me, you might view it as a nurturing environment for flowers and vegetables or trees. Another thing soil is, is an amazingly complex topic. In fact, there's estimated to be 42,000 scholarly papers published annually on the topic of soil science. That ranges from, from geology to chemistry to biology to big agriculture. I spent my whole life in academia. I know how hard it is to publish um, uh, scholarly papers, if you want to call them that. It takes a lot of time and effort. That means that 
the people power going into studying the soil is astounding. And we're learning things because of the technologies that have evolved over the last few years that we never knew before. So what I say today may or may not be relevant in five years, probably will, but there may be a few things, but we're learning so much more about soil. Now, to, to try to understand the complexity of soil science is kind of like this, a daunting task. And one that we shouldn't worry about, let's worry about concepts. I'm gonna stay with concepts tonight. Yeah, I'm gonna give you some factoids along the way, but I wanna keep coming back with the conceptual element of what soil is, how we take care of it, and how it helps our plants grow. So let's talk about soil composition. Do a little of the physical part of soil. What is soil? Whether it's a handful or a, a wheelbarrow load or a shovel full, what's it made out of? Plants need air. We don't think about that. Plants have a respiration like we do. Well, it's different, but biochemically it's the same. They have respiration. Microorganisms, which I'm gonna talk a lot about, need air. Everything needs air, but you don't think about that as part of soil. So when you look, this is one of the take home messages I'd like you to remember after this talk. This is kind of the generic composition of soil. We talked about the air, 25% volume, whether it's a handful or a shovelful or a truckload, 25% of, of that volume is air, 25% is water in a good case scenario. That's what we call the pore space, which is very critical to soil. Then we have the solid phase of soil. We have the, the lion's share of it is the or inorganic minerals. This is the component that came from rock. Soil comes from decomposed rock that takes millions of years to happen. Whether it's granite or lava, it breaks down into what we call topsoil. That's the inorganic uh, minerals. And the other solid component, which I'm gonna talk a good bit about, is the organic part. But this is really important. The absolute numbers, not so much as you have air, water, minerals, and organics in a good soil. So let's talk just about for a minute, just about the minerals. This is the part that comes from rocks. These are some of the elements or the uh, minerals that we see in soil. We have macronutrients and they're only called macronutrients because there are more of them than the trace elements over here. Most of the trace uh, nutrients are metals, iron, zinc, copper, and they are critically important to certain bio uh, biochemical reactions in the soil, in the microorganisms, in the plants. This is very important to the integrity of soil. Now, when you go to the box store or you go to a garden store and you buy a bag of garden soil or potting soil, there's a lot of good stuff in there, but I can tell you what not in there very much is this. There's not many uh, uh, minerals in those bag soils. In fact, here's three. Uh, I took the pictures just the day before yesterday of three different products. The bottom two, the yellow one and the blue, and you don't have to read all this stuff. The yellow one and the blue one said soil in their title. The brown one up here said potting mix or some such thing. But if you look at them, all of them, what's one of the first products that you see? Forest products. These are forest products. What you don't see very much is minerals. Now, in these two soils, they have a thing called perlite. If you've ever opened a bag of soil that has that white, those little white particles, that's perlite. Perlite actually is a mineral, but it's used in these products for aeration, to get, keep air in the soil. And the thing about perlite, it's kind of locked. You can't get the minerals out of it. So my whole point is that while this, there's nothing wrong with these products at all, they are amendments for the soil, but they're not really soil because they don't have the minerals in there. Now, I'm going to push a webinar that's going to happen a month from now. One of my colleagues who's answering questions, Monica, tonight, she's going to give talk on soil and amendments, and she will enhance what I say, I hope, by going in more detail about fertilizers and amendments. But I'm just saying that sometimes you got to read the ingredients, what you buy to make sure, or if you buy in bulk from a, from a soil plant landscape place, make sure they're giving you some minerals, not just forest products. So the next thing about soil is texture, the texture of your soil. 
And that's the components. They're the mineral fraction of the soil. And we know them as sand, silt, and clay. That's what makes up soil texture. And these are particles that are differentiated from one another based on size. Sand is the most coarse size. You can see over here the size up to two millimeters in size for a soil particle. That's a, that's a big uh, particle down to the finest particle of all, which is clay. You have all of these. And now I'm, I'm kind of, I'm handpicking the pros and cons for my own, uh, but, but try to make some points. Sand, sandy soil is very low in organics. It does not hold on to moisture very well at all. Think about a beach. If you walk down a beach and a wave washes in, the water vanishes. Why? Because it just goes right down through the soil. Because it doesn't hold uh, moisture, it doesn't hold nutrients very well either. And nutrients leach out of sandy soil very easily. Now, silt is smaller than sand, but bigger than clay, and it's better at retaining moisture and nutrients. Now, why is it better? We have to get into electrostatic properties and all this chemistry and physics. I don't want to get into that. So I'm, you just have to take my word for it. The silt is smaller than sand, but it's better at holding on to stuff. And the best thing of all is clay. Now, if I if we were all here in a room and I could say, how many of you are familiar with clay? I bet almost everybody in the county would raise their hand. And in a lot of ways, in a negative way, clay is hard to work with, but you know what? Clay is the most nutritious soil there is, it's just loaded with minerals and nutrients because of the size of the particles and the charges, the uh, electrostatic charges holds on to stuff. But we all know that it's highly susceptible to compaction in the wintertime. If you step on it, you push out all that air and it gets to be a mess. And right now it's hard as a rock. But what we really are all faced with is loamy soils. That's what we have. Loamy soils is a combination of these three texture elements. If we had equal amounts of sand, silt, and clay, we probably have the perfect soil, but we don't. But what we have is a combination. We get good water and nutrient holding capacity from the silt and the clay, and we get good infiltration of air and water from the sand. Most of us in this county, I don't know where everybody is from, but most of us in Contra Costa County have clay loam soil. Clay is the heavy uh, element, but we also have sand and silt in there. And there is nothing wrong with clay. You just have to augment it with lots of organics. It makes a wonderful soil. Another aspect of soil in terms of its structure are called aggregates. And sand, silt, and clay are attracted to one another for a variety of, of chemical and physical reasons which I'm not gonna go into. And they also glom onto organic material. And these calls form aggregates, which store and supply lots of nutrients for plants. And they also provide small and large pores for what? Water and air. You remember two major elements in soil. I read an article recently and the author likened soil aggregates to grape nut cereal. I don't know how many of you have known or do know about grape nut soil, little aggregates, little crunchy things. That's what soil aggregates are. They're down there, but they help pass the nutrients on to the plants. So what's the bottom line for you and me in our soil at home? You know what? Your soil is what you have and you're not gonna change it. We have clay loam soil here. We can't change the base, but what you can do is enrich it with organics and so forth. You'll hear a lot more of that in the fertilizer and amendment uh, talk in a month, but that's, I'll, I'll keep hitting it. Adding organics is really important to soil health. No matter what you have, if you're gonna do a, a bed in your native soil, your clay soil or clay loam soil, or if you're going to, make a raised bed with purchased soil you get from a landscape company or somewhere, you might wanna test that soil. Or if you're having problems with certain plants in your yard, you might wanna test it, why? Because you can find out if you have too much or too little of something. If you're missing some uh, critical uh, minerals or if you have too much of it. To find out what your pH, that is the acidity or the alkalinity of soil. pH is a 14 point scale. 
Seven is in the middle. Seven is neutral. That's where plants like to be. Six, eight to seven, two, they like to be in that. Some plants like blueberries like more acid soil, but nonetheless, most of the time, uh, plants like a neutral soil. And most of our soils here, our clay loam is in fact uh, neutral or near neutral. But you want to find out what it is. And a good soil test will not only provide what's there or what's not there, but it'll provide strategies to fix it. Now, as master gardeners, we don't endorse any particular um, uh, testing laboratory, but we have a handout, which I think we'll put in the chat, I hope, of four labs that have been vetted by our help desk people that give good soil tests. I recommend that you do that. You don't have to do it, but I recommend it because sometimes it's nice to know what you're starting with and what you can do to improve it. So we're back now to our co soil composition. The thing I want you to remember, like I say, these, the pore space will change with drought, will change with weather, but basically just know air, water, organics, and inorganic minerals. That's what makes soil healthy. Now I'm gonna talk about this part. This is the organic part. Most papers or most articles say, most gardens have uh, soil um, uh, organics of one to 5%. Uh, our demonstration garden in Walnut Creek is 10 to 15% because we've integrated so much organics over time. Nonetheless, I'm gonna just talk about this corner. What is this made out of? This 5%, what's it made of? So this represents that 5%. You have fresh residue, which means newly dyed uh, plants or animals. Uh, a third to half of that 5% is actively decomposing organic material. Things are breaking down right now. About equal amount of stabilized organic material, which can't be broken down any farther. And then you have, of that 5%, you have 5% of that, which is living organisms. So what does all this mean with respect to soil? Well, it means it's alive. <clears throat> I hope at the end of this, you'll jump for joy like this lady. Probably not, but at least you could be happy that soil is alive. And that's one of the take home messages that I want to give. Okay, some people, some critics say that soil is minerals, water and air, and it is not alive. Only the microorganisms are alive. Okay, but that's splitting hairs. For me, I'm going to say soil is alive because of what's in there. And I'm going to tell you what's in there, because you're probably asking yourself or asking me, John, how alive is it? Well, we're going to go into that. And in order to do that, I need to use a sophisticated analytical tool. What's an analytical tool? It's a tool that allows you to get a number or a value of something. So my sophisticated analytical tool is a teaspoon. You might have one at your house. I have multiple ones. I have brightly colored plastic ones in my garage, so I won't lose them. One teaspoon holds about 4.2 grams of soil. There's 453 grams per pound. So this is a fraction by, you know how much coffee or sugar or anything will fit in a level teaspoon. Not very much. It is the spooky number. Three, it's greater than 3 billion with a B with a B, that's in that one teaspoon of soil. When you look at soil like this, at the end of, the, at the end of this talk, you will, you will be able to tell me what's wrong with this picture. But nonetheless, when you look at this picture, you see all this soil and they go, does it look very alive to me? If you think three billion in a teaspoon, how much could be out there? What's well, kind of looking at the ocean also, you go, well, it's a beautiful, nice blue ocean, but it doesn't look very, very alive to me until you look under the surface. And then you see this. This is macroscopic. In other words, we can see it with our eyes without any lenses or microscopes. What an incredible ecosystem under the uh, surface of, of, the, of the sea. It's the same in the soil, except we can't see them. These are microscopic creatures. So let's go and look at that. What is in one? teaspoon of soil. Well, we've already said the bacteria. And there's, I, you see the number here is 4 billion with a B. I read a scientific article from a soil scientist at Davis, and he said there's about 
one billion bacteria per gram of soil. There's four grams in that teaspoon, therefore I get this. You look at this bacteria, this is called a bacillus. It's the shape of them. And you see all these little tails here, those are called flagella. What are they for? For them to swim. Where do they swim? Well, there's water in soil, remember? 25% of it is water, not dripping soil, not puddled water, microscopic water that's held onto the soil aggregates that I talked about. We can't get into all the physics behind that, A, because I don't understand it all, but B, it's not important. Only there's a lot of bacteria there. Next in line in terms of numbers are almost a half a billion things called actinomycetes. We look at these individual things that are like links on a chain, and they kind of the shape of this. So people thought, well, it must be a bacterium. Then other people weighed in and go, yeah, but look at how they're, they're big, long chains. So they must be a fungus. Some people said, well, maybe they're the missing link. Well, no. Our sophisticated technologies now have come up and said, these guys are bacteria. So why didn't I just lump them over here with that? Well, because these are kind of important to the soil. If you go out tomorrow morning into your garden bed, assuming your cat and dog haven't been there, and you pick up a double handful and hold it to your face, that smell, that rich smell of earth is actinomycetes. That's why I bring it up. Next in line in terms of number, which is a very important group of microorganisms in the soil called fungi. There's 4 million of them in that teaspoon. There's also about 400,000 algae. Algae, you think algae, why would algae be in soil? Because there's water in the soil. If you took a sample, maybe out in the Delta or in the Southeast part of the United States, you probably get higher numbers, but it doesn't matter. There's lots of algae and there's a, quite a number of protozoans. Somewhere in your educational lifetime, you were introduced to protozoa and it was through an amoeba maybe. You know the amoeba that crawl along the, the bottom of ponds or wherever they live. Well, there's other single celled animals as well that are in the protozoan family. These are called paramecium. And you see the fuzz around the edge of this one? That are, those are called cilia and that's how they swim once again. And I will tell you why these guys are important. And lastly, you see nematodes. About five, these are microscopic roundworms. And I'll tell you what they do as well. These all are in one teaspoon of soil. Now, if you took a shovel full of that same soil, you're gonna see earthworms or maybe an arthropod, which would be an insect or a millipede or something. If you took a truckload, you might get a gopher or a mole. I would say that soil is alive based on this. So what are all these microorganisms doing? And that's the critical part. They are enriching your soil. They are up in that valley in Colorado, making that, that valley gorgeous. Because these microorganisms are interacting with one another, they're competing for minerals, they're competing for other nutrients like nitrogen they're, and carbon, they're recycling them. They're, they're getting these minerals into their body and then they are consumed by another organism and the excess nutrients are passed out into the soil. And by doing that, they are enriching the soil. It's very critical to good soil health and good soil health is critical to good plant health. Brings us to the soil food web. Don't even try to read all these things unless you want to, that's not the point. The point is, here are all these organisms I talked about, the millions of organisms, and they're all interacting with one another. You see the arrows going every which way. And that's really critical. What would happen if you lost this fungus? You would have upstream and downstream effects in your soil food web. Soil food web is absolutely critical to good soil health, which is absolutely critical to maintaining your garden ecosystem. The microorganisms are really critical, but the way it starts is all with the plants and the sun. Here's a little plant biology that's absolutely critical to this process. And this is the plants and the sun, other known as photosynthesis. I'll bet everybody here has at least heard about it. Photosynthesis is an incredibly complicated set of pathways. When I was learning it as an undergraduate, it made my eyes roll. It's even more complicated now, 
But you know what? We don't need to know that complication. We need to know this. This is the basics of photosynthesis. Carbon dioxide, which is a gas, which we exhale and factories exhale. So carbon dioxide plus water from the soil plus sunlight. Now, these three factors come together in some miraculous way, which I don't claim to understand all the nuances, but it takes place in these little green structures here called chloroplasts. Chloroplasts are filled with chlorophyll, which is the thing that makes plants green. So chloroplasts plus these all come together and a miracle happens and sugar and oxygen uh, are formed. I am not overstating this by saying, if you don't have this process going on, we don't exist because we need this. Now I'm gonna take it just a, a baby step deeper. I'm not gonna get into the real, the nitty gritty of photosynthesis, but just a little bit deeper. What are, the pro, what are other uh, products of photosynthesis? They're called photosynthates. Sugar and oxygen are the big players because they, they're bolded here, you see that. But sugars break down, they break into component parts. And then other molecules are made from them along with minerals from the soil. Remember the importance of the minerals. So from that, you get things like proteins. Everybody knows proteins. I'll bet a lot of people today had a protein shake in the morning. Proteins, all kinds of proteins are made from photosynthesis. Amino acids are the little building blocks from which all proteins are made. So you get both of these. You get lipids, which are fats. They're a product of photosynthesis. Flavonoid is just, it's a signaling molecule. And I only put it on here because I'm gonna mention it in a minute. And there's lots of organic acids, citric acid, malic acid, and all these acids that are critical to processes within microorganisms, within plant roots and everything. So all of these things are made from photosynthesis. What happens to them? This is really neat if you think about it. So carbon dioxide and sunlight and water in the chloroplast makes all those compounds that I mentioned. And they are used by the plant itself to support the growth reproduction defense. Isn't that a neat system? The plant makes its own defense uh, molecules, its own reproductive molecules. It does it itself. But there's about 25% of all those things I mentioned that go down into the roots and are exuded into the soil. They're called plant exudates. So what's an exudate? Some of you may be of my generation. And there's an old cliche about horses sweat, men perspire, and women glow. Well, no matter how you call perspiration, is it something that's exuded from our pores? And that's what an exudate, exudate is. The plant exudes all those molecules into the soil. And where does that happen? It happens in an area called the rhizosphere. Scientists always like to put Greek or Latin roots on word. Rhizo means root. So why didn't they just call it a root sphere or a root zone? I don't know, but that's what you could call it. It's an area in close association with these roots, just a few millimeters, where these exudates are sent out into the soil and where most of the microbes are. If you did a microbial count of all those numbers I gave you, it probably 10 to 100 fold higher here than out here because they're working in concert with the plant roots. And in a recent, relatively recent, two years ago, very prestigious scientific journal called the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And the author said, quoted as a direct quote, is that the rhizosphere is one of the most complex ecosystems on earth. That's really saying a lot, in my opinion. Think of all the ecosystems on earth and soil is one of the most complex. That's why we need to understand it more. And where is the rhizosphere? This is called a soil profile. This is the soil horizon. This is the bedrock. This is intermediate. This is where the soil came from. It's still breaking down over time. This is more broken down. But this is the topsoil level. This is where the rhizosphere is. Yeah, there's roots down here. Most of the action is right up here. So what happens when you take a rototiller through this? Or you turn it over with a shovel? 
you disrupt all these interactions that are going on. Now, does that mean that you can't grow anything there? No, it does not mean that. But we are trying to talk about a sustainable ecosystem, whether it's in your backyard or that valley in Colorado or in the park down the street or in the Sierras or in the grasslands or in the shoreline, something that's sustainable, that will take care of itself with minimal uh, influence of us. So you don't want to turn this over too much because it's right here. I like to think of the rhizosphere as a snack shack. Okay, this is, here's the analogy. So this lady has decided she wants to buy a jalapeno cheddar corn dog. Now, I don't know about you. I think I'd rather get snake bit than eat a corn dog. But that's just me. If this was Cheetos, we'd be talking something completely different. Now, this woman wanted to buy a corn dog. So she goes up with $3 or whatever the price is, and she hands three bucks to this gentleman with a hat backwards. She, he give, she gives him the money. He gives her the corn dog. That interaction, both parties benefited. It's called symbiosis. That's really critical. So you, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. That's what's happening in the soil with this universe beneath our feet. So let me put it in other terms. So what does the plant do? Plants produce exudates and different plants produce different exudates. And they these exudates do lots of things. They feed microorganisms, they signal them, they attract them or they repel them. And they do other things as well. But these are just some of the main things. So the exudates from the plant do all these things to or with the microorganisms. So in the snack shack analogy, what do the microorganisms give back? They promote the acquisition of nutrients in the plant. They help the plant grow and develop and they influence the uh, uh, plant defenses against uh, diseases. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. This is the snack shack. This is symbiosis. This is so critical to plant health. I can't overemphasize it, how much this, uh, how well this works. Let me give you an example. If you're confused by any of this, let me give you an example of nutrient acquisition. And we'll talk about nitrogen. Nitrogen, as probably all of you who are gardeners know, are very, very important to plants. They make plants green. They are important to photosynthesis. They do all sorts of things. 78% of the air that you and I are breathing right now is nitrogen. Plants can't use nitrogen gas. They just can't. Here's an analogy I do. Suppose you go out into the ocean in a motorboat or a sailboat, and you brought somebody along who had the picnic, and you go out in the middle of the ocean out here, way out, and then the motor fails or the wind dies down, and you're surrounded by water, and the person who brought the picnic forgot to bring the drinking water. You are surrounded by water, which you can't use. That's what happens with nitrogen and plants. So nitrogen is arguably the most important nutrient in many ways. So how do they use it? Remember, 25% of your soil is air. There's air down there. There's nitrogen down there. Plants can't use it. So the gas needs to be changed, or as they say in plant speak, it has to be fixed into a form that plants can use, ammonium or, or uh, nitrate or something. Who does that? Bacteria do that job. There's families of bacteria specifically do that job. They change the nitrogen from the gas into the nitrogen the plant can use. Some of these bacteria are associated with legumes. Maybe you've heard of them, uh, peas and beans and lentils. But let me show you an example of how this works. And I took a little bit of license here with my storytelling, but it's all legit. This is a fava bean. These are the fava bean roots. The soil has been washed away. When the fava bean is growing, it, it exudes, it, it, it uh, produces an exudate called a flavonoid. I mentioned that earlier. The flavonoid goes out there and recruits bacteria. It says, we need you over here. The bacteria attach themselves to the root, and they then signal the plant saying, we need a home. Do something to help us have a home, and we'll give you what you need. So the plant produces these nodules. It's like a scab on a on a abrasion on your arm. The plant builds this nodules around gazillion bacteria in there. And those bacteria are taking nitrogen gas 
and make it into a form that the plant can use. Now, if you should, this is, a, fava beans can be a cover crop. If you cut this fava bean at soil level, all this good nitrogen is there for other plants, for when you plant your tomatoes, when you plant your other things. This is really important. And this is whole snack shack symbiotic thing. The plant uh, gives uh, the uh, bacteria nutrients, the bacteria changes nitrogen to a form the plant can use. This happens in other examples. I'm not going to go into detail. Phosphorus and sulfur are very important to soil health. And in general, they are unavailable to plants in most of the forms in the soil. But you add some fungus and all of a sudden, these two critical things are made in a form that a plant can use. So who are some of these micro... Uh, microbial players, this universe beneath your feet. Who are they? We've talked about them, but let's go just, just a tad deeper about what they are. Well, the bacteria we've talked a lot about, those are the ones that are in such high numbers, 4 billion per teaspoon. They are the decomposers. They take dead animal bodies or dead plant bodies and they decompose them, break them down into critical elements or nutrients, nitrogen, carbon, phosphorus, potassium, and sulfur, and more. They break it down and they incorporate all these things into their bodies, into their body wall, are all these nutrients. So what happens then to these bacteria? Bacteria don't live very long. They, they have a half-life of 12 hours or 24 hours, then they die. That's called lysis. The cell breaks open and all those critical uh, nutrients are released. Where? in the rhizosphere, right by the roots where the plant can take them up. That's one way. There's another pathway, if you will, that's uh, important and that's with the protozoans. Now, relative size here. If a bacteria was the size of a pea, then a paramecium would be the size of a large watermelon. So they eat a lot of bacteria, but the bacteria incorporates all this into their bodies in a higher concentration than what this protozoan needs. So what it, it has extra nutrients. What does it do with them? It excretes them. It poops them out. Let's get right down to it. Poops them out into the rhizosphere in a form that the plants can use. That's a pretty neat for, uh, uh, system right there. Here's another one, the fungi. They are really important to soil health. Now, we all know the mushrooms or the... Um, um, uh, toadstools. These are the reproductive, these are the uh, uh, reproductive aspects of the fungus. I wouldn't eat these particular uh, mushrooms. This one does funny things to your brain, but uh, you know, the psychedelic things. But nonetheless, the business end of the, of the uh, fungus is down below the ground here, down below the surface. And this is the business part of the fungus. Individual strands here are called a hypha, Many of them are called hyphae, and the whole bunch of them are called the mycelium. You may remember, actually in our recent past, when we actually had wet winters, and you could have very damp yard, you might go down there and have a board laying in your damp yard and flip it over, and you'd see something like this. Fungi particularly like to gobble up wood. But you would see that, that's the fungus doing its job. But here's the business end of the fungi. These are the hypha. They're like a net, a real dense network. Think of that one teaspoon of soil. Remember that teaspoon we had? That has several yards of these in there. They're everywhere. Don't walk on them. They're incredibly fragile. And they're like a hairnet. And they're critical to, what, remember I talked about the uh, great nut cereal aggregate idea. They help hold soil aggregates together. Aggregates are important to getting nutrients to plants and getting air and water down into the soil. Nutrients, here's a whole list of them, flow through these hypha, which are narrow straw-like structures. So when the fungus dies, and it does, these nutrients all of a sudden become available to the plant in a form that the plant can use. Plus, it leaves a microscopic um, uh, system of tunnels for what? air and water. Remember the, the, the poor uh, space of soil, air and water. 
Now, the last part of the fungus I want to talk about is really important. It's called mycorrhizae. Once again, um, uh, Greek form, uh, mycorrhizae means fungus root. And keeping in mind that scientists always like to put just uh, unintelligible words together, the mycorrhizae fungi is called an obligate biotroph. And you're going, what does that mean? I'll tell you what I mean. It means that without the host plant, it cannot survive. This is the host plant. I don't know what this plant is, doesn't matter. You see the host plant, you see the roots of the host plant coming down here and here and over here. All the rest of this is a fungus that needs that plant to survive. If it doesn't have the plant, it will not survive. It'll form spores and just sit there. And it's symbiotic with the plant. The plant gives it sugar, and the fungus gives it all kinds of nutrients, including phosphorus is one of the big ones. And of all the plants you have in your yard, pretty much the lion's share of them have these relationships. And you can see just visually that this fungus extends the surface area of the roots by 10 to a thousand fold. That's critical in drought conditions like what we're in right now, because it enables the plant to get more water than if it didn't have this association. Mycorrhizae fungi are well documented in all kinds of things. It helps plants become established and survive. They are important in leaf root and shoot growth and in the yield of whatever the plant is. If it's a fruit tree, a nut a tree, oil, this fungus through mechanisms that I don't claim to understand, it's far too sophisticated for me in my old age, but it doesn't. These mycorrhizae fungi, they, they say they colonize the plant. That, and here's how it works. So you have the roots of these plants and they send out a signal, an exudate to a spore, a fungal spore. The spore germinates and sends out a single hyphae into the root or around the root. They either actually burrow into the root of the plant or surround, doesn't matter what. But once these plants are colonized by these fungi, they are more resistant to environmental stresses, one of which we're right in the middle of, drought, salt stress. Salt is not table salt. Salt is just, it's just a chemical term for a positive and a negative charged molecule that come together, form salt. Um, Potassium uh, chloride, ammonium sulfite, ammonium uh, nitrate, those are all salts. Some salts in synthetic fertilizers, they get salts in other ways. We're not going to go into detail, but it can be a stress to plants. And the fungus um, minimizes that stress along with heavy metal stress. The fungus makes plants more resistant to root pathogens. There are bad guys down in the soil, but either through chemical means or physical means, it's, look at that, it's a network. Maybe the, the bad guys can't get through that into the roots. And the fungus in ways that, once again, I don't know the mechanism, makes plants less susceptible to opportunistic pests. Think aphids, something like that. Amazing what this these fungi, and there's multiple types of mycorrhizae fungi. It's amazing what they do for the plant. Here's something, and this actually is state-of-the-art science, so I'm not going to go into detail, but it's actually really important. If you've been reading about soil and atmosphere and the sequestration of carbon, we have too much carbon in our atmosphere. And they're wondering how we can get more of that soil sequestered into the soil by the plants. Mycorrhizae fungi produce a substance. It's called glomalin or glomalin however you want to say it. It's a, a glycoprotein, which means it's part sugar and part proteins. It's a sticky substance, once again, for soil aggregation, keeps soil stuck together. But here's what's really important. Gloman stores 30, up to 30% 30 of the world's soil carbon. You're going to be hearing about soil and, and carbon and plants. And this fungus, which is in our flower beds, is important to storing that carbon. So how do you manage something as fragile as this organism and the bacteria? Well, minimal or no-till. You don't want to dig this up too much. You don't want to damage them. You want to reduce nutrient input. Here's something maybe you haven't thought about. If you give that plant in this picture, before it has the fungus, if you give it some synthetic phosphate, fertilizer, 
The plant loves it. It doesn't care where it gets the nutrients. If you give it to it, it'll take it up. But if it does that, it won't give the signal for the mycorrhizae to come in and colonize it and do all the other things. So you want to not put too much fertilizer down if you don't need it, because it can have an adverse effect on these microorganisms. And then it has an upstream effect. All these other positive things these organisms do are lost. And lastly, to manage these delicate microorganisms, bacteria and fungi together, use cover crops. Don't let your garden, I don't care how big the garden bed is, don't let it be bare. Have something growing in it all the time. If your tomato beds that you're almost done in another few weeks, put cover crops in there, put winter veggies in there, keep roots growing in there because these are obligate biotropes. They need roots to survive, help them survive. Then we're almost done here. We have some larger critters in your soil the invertebrates, the earthworm, the bigger nematodes, the arthropods, these are both arthropods. This is a mite, this is a millipede. These guys eat bacteria and fungus and pass through their nutrients through their intestinal tract into the soil, which can be used by plants. Or the bigger arthropods chew up organic material into little pieces, pass it through their intestinal tract. Now the bacteria and fungi can work on them. And of course, earthworms, they aerate soil just by crawling through there. They eat, they eat uh, bacteria, they carry bacteria on their slimy bodies. They increase the water and nutrient holding capacity by opening up channels in the soil. And of course, their excretion is high in nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. They're called earthworm castings. These are all positive things that help and work with the microorganisms. So what we should make of all this, I've given you a lot of information, maybe information that you really are interested in, maybe not so interested in, but what's the so what? I want you to remember a few things. First of all, if soil is 50% solid, that's minerals and organic, and 50% pore space, air and water. That's really critical. Remember that. Remember that soil is a living resource. There's lots going on down there. A fully active soil food bowl facilitates better nutrient retention and is critical for the survival and establishment of plants. Why is that? Because the, the elements of the food chain take up the, the nutrients into their body walls. They, so they're not leached away by water like some of the synthetic fertilizers are. They're taken up into the bodies of the uh, different microorganisms. And then when those microorganisms, sorry, <laughs> are consumed or die, those, uh, those nutrients are made available to the plant. So what should we do then to try to nurture and to maintain this universe beneath our feet? And I'm putting this up here just to remind us of what we're doing. Yes, we don't have it like this. All those things I talked about are happening in here and keeping this valley vibrant. And it's happening in your backyard. Use organic material, compost and mulches. In the webinar that Monica is going to give next month, I'm going to talk more about the organic materials, the compost and mulches, the amendments. But use these organic materials integrated into your native soils. Two, distur disturb the soil ecosystem as little as possible. Limit or don't do any till. Now, am I saying there's never a time when you should chew up the, the soil and break it up and get the organics in? No, I'm not saying that. This clay loam that we have is hard. You have to break it up and get the organics into it. In our demonstration garden, we broke up the clay soil with a tractor. But over the last 12 years, we've integrated so much material into that clay. It's gorgeous soil. So sometimes you have to, you have to till. But once your soil is going, once a soil food web is established, once we have something like this, not quite like this in your backyard, admittedly, but once you have it, then don't disturb it so much. Be stingy with fertilizer. Use only when needed. That's the, that's the utility of the soil test. Or if something starts going wrong, get a soil test. Don't just throw out something that you don't need. I know for a fact, in our new volunteer training, we have the students do a simple soil test that you can buy. It just gives you nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, and potassium. And we find that most of the soils in the county are very high in potassium and phosphorus. 
So you don't need to go buy a balanced 10, 10, 10 fertilizer because it doesn't need phosphorus and potassium. It may need nitrogen, yes. But be stingy with fertilizers because they can have adverse effects on the microorganisms. Remember pore space. Remember that there's air in the soil. Don't walk on your beds, no matter what kind of bed. Try not to walk on them. If you have to get out on them, use a board or something to distribute your body weight so you don't crush that soil and push out the air. And remember that the various biocides are designed to kill things. That's what herbicides, pesticides, fungicides, and miticides do. A fungicide can kill those critical mycorrhizae bacteria, uh, bacteria, fungi. Also, photosynthesis brings life to the soil through all those exudates. So keep something growing in your soil all the time. In the winter, grow winter veggies or cover crops. And lastly, diversity reduces. Diversity is incredibly important. Most of our gardens are diverse. We don't have just corn or just tomatoes. We have lots of stuff. And plants have different exudates that recruit different microbial populations that do different things for plants. And diversity keeps more good guys than bad. And by simple um, uh, competition, they drive the bad guys out. So I hope that you see soil in a slightly different perspective than you ever did before. And I know there's probably a lot of unanswered questions, but I want you to think about this whole universe beneath your feet. I want you to get out there and get your hands in it and to learn to love and to protect that universe. And I thank you for your attention. I hope that you got something out of this and Gail, I'll turn it back over to you.